Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello, thank you for joining us for this live webinar to discuss how to protect our patients by preventing the spread of infections in the wake of the outbreak of the coronavirus or COVID-19. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Access. We are a leading home health care technology company offering a complete suite of easy to use innovative software solutions, empowering home health, home care, and hospice providers to grow their business while making lives better. The presenters for today are going to be myself, Matt Abbott. Uh, I have been a hospice nurse for over a decade uh, before joining the Access team to help build Access Hospice, which is our solution that was built by hospice experts for hospice professionals. Along with me today is Wendy Conlon. Wendy leads our client experience team, but began her career as a physical therapist and has worked in healthcare at home for two decades. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, everyone's lines have been muted. However, you may submit questions throughout the webinar. If time permits, we will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. However, if we don't have time to answer your questions, we will follow up with you after the webinar. Following this webinar, we will provide everyone with a link to the slides and post a recording of the webinar on our website, access.com. So without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. As you can see today, we're gonna to be talking about emergency preparedness and infection control. Uh, and we're going to help you uh, plan for the worst while protecting your patients, your clinicians, as well as the community at large. Our objectives for the day today, will be to define emergency preparedness and infection control. We'll explore some challenges faced by the impact of COVID-19 on the industry. We'll give some best practices for both emergency preparedness and infection control to help you prevent any survey deficiencies. We know even though we are navigating a new frontier of uh, how we perform our work, that those surveys still are happening uh, just as they were before the outbreak. We're also going to talk about how technology can be a solution for the challenges that we're discussing, and we will provide you a list of resources for continued learning and training that will help keep you up to date as we work through the changing environment we're currently in. So we're going to start first with some definitions. I'll hand this off to Wendy. Thank you, Matt. Good day, everyone. Yes, let's talk about an emergency preparedness program and what this really means, uh, both to us now, but always. This is a fundamental part of our post-acute home in the care in the home space. So let, let's talk this through. An emergency preparedness rule requires adequate planning for both a natural and man-made disaster and coordination with our federal, state, tribal, regional, and local emergency preparedness systems. So this is really coordination at the community level to support our care for patients and clients in their home. There are four key elements, as we see here on the slide, that really comprise a strong and solid emergency preparedness program. And so we wanna take a look at each one, our risk assessment and planning, policies and procedures, communication plan, and training and testing. Let's take a deep dive into each. So our risk assessment and planning, this is the core fundamental of how we're going to build out an emergency preparedness plan. And really what this entails is for the agency to walk through an all hazards vulnerability risk assessment analysis. That's a lot of words. Um, and really what that looks like is regionally, what would be the risks uh, that the agency or organization may encounter. So we can think of that as perhaps a flood or a tornado, an earthquake, that type of thing. Or if we're in a metropolitan area, potentially an active shooter, uh, some type of a, a warfare or something along those lines. So the organization would, would take an actual all hazards assessment and, and really rate their risk accordingly and then prioritize those risks. From there, the organization must identify the essential functions that they will need to put in place in order to be successful during an emergency 
plan when the plan is executed and also identify the individuals in the organization who would be responsible for each task or each operation during the actual crisis. So that is our core for an emergency preparedness program. And then we would move on to our policies and procedures. We know that the policies and procedures are the core for all of our organizations, right? We are absolutely held accountable to those policies and procedures. So the emergency preparedness plan itself becomes part of the policy and procedure for the organization. And we also know that those policy and procedures are beholden to the conditions of participation. So we have a nice streamline there of compliance, which is really critical. We also must state that the, uh, that plan, that emergency preparedness plan must be reviewed annually from that policy and procedure perspective to ensure that uh, it remains true for that organization as part of that policy and procedure. And then we wanna look at our communication plan. Uh, you will hear me talk a lot during this presentation about a communication plan because in communication is at the core of what we what we always talk about anyway in terms of life in general right communicate 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 that's our key to success well certainly in a time of an emergency when we have activated an emergency preparedness plan communication becomes paramount and so we want to ensure that uh, organizations are considering perhaps alternate means of communication because depending on the emergency or the disaster in place our our frequent lines of communication may be altered. Organizations can consider a phone tree where they would consider uh, that person A would be responsible for calling five people, person B would then call five people and all the way down the line to ensure that we were communicating with all of our employees uh, that are going to be part of operating during this plan. We would also want to have a backup in terms of what happens if we're unable to reach a certain individual and how how are we going to go about getting those means um, to, to reach that patient and individual in that time. The, um, the communication plan must include our staff, our caregivers, our uh, patients and their families. It's critical that it becomes comprehensive to all that would be involved in the emergency. We also want to ensure that that communication plan is in cooperation and collaboration with the local tribal, regional, state, and or federal, federal emergency preparedness officials. Because during an emergency, there may be times when we need to be sharing medical information with them. Again, all HIPAA compliant, but remember in the time of an emergency, if we have patients or clients that we are not able to access and we need help from uh, our our community, we have to have a communication plan already in place before that emergency is in effect so that we know how to reach each other. And in addition to that, taking that one step farther, we want to ensure that we're able to communicate with our institutions, our hospital institutions, our nursing home and rehab institutions, because in the event of emergency, and we're seeing this a little bit now in our country, we certainly saw it in other countries in relation to COVID-19, our hospitals may become full, our nursing homes may become full or at capacity, and those folks may need to discharge patients that are of less need, perhaps less medically critical, that could go home. They would want to partner with an organization in the, in the home care space, so caring for patients and clients in the home, we would want to, as an organization, identify criteria by which we would be able to accept their patients. And then in the reverse, if we had patients that were critical at home and needed to um, seek medical attention, we would want that partnership and communication plan with the hospital and or the nursing home rehab that we would be able to transition patients to them, those that needed a little bit more medical care or a lot more medical care than what we were able to uh, provide in the home. So again, communication is, is really at the foundation of success for all of us, and, and we'll keep talking about that throughout the, the presentation, but uh, that communication plan is critical. And then we also have the training and testing, which uh, 
We can create plans as all day long, but we have to ensure that we train our staff accordingly to the plan so that in the event of an emergency, when we have to activate the plan, our staff knows what to expect, the operation remains seamless, and our staff feels good. We want to be able to reduce the anxiety by having a lot of training for our staff so that they are ready to go. And in, in order to do that, part of that training and testing involves one of uh, the requirements from an emergency preparedness program is that we run through as an organization two drills every year, and we have to document those drills. Uh, one of those drills would be a full out drill. So we would actually walk through the process as if we were in an emergency and document as such. And the second drill would be could be a tabletop drill where we were walking through uh, potential scenarios and what have you. But that is the key elements um, of an emergency preparedness program uh, as fundamentals. And we will launch from there in terms of other um, elements of that. I mentioned to you that the emergency preparedness plan is a condition of participation. So I've listed here the uh, condition of participation uh, where we can find that for home health and hospice. In addition to the key elements that we just talked about, uh, I wanna go a little bit deeper so that coming through this uh, webinar, uh, we can really understand uh, some of the key features of, of a plan. and. In addition to the all hazards vulnerability risk assessment that the organization is doing, that's for the organization itself. The organization also needs to consider the specific population that they serve and what are the needs of that population. That must be included in their emergency preparedness plan so that uh, we are able to address all of the needs of our patients um, in an emergency and, and we can anticipate what those may be. We've got plans in place for those. We also need to ensure the continuity of services during and or after the emergency. Uh, as organizations, when we accept the responsibility for a patient or a client, that becomes our onus. And so we must uh, be able to provide care uh, and keep that patient uh, as safe and um, taken care of as we can during the emergency. So we have to think through what that continuity plan would be and document that as well. To help us do that, at the time of admission, it's critically important that we're helping our caregivers and our clinicians identify an emergency triage level for each patient or client that we're serving. And we want to think about this. Oftentimes, what we see is that organizations have a level one, a level two, and a level three when it comes to triaging patients. And again, um, this would be individual to the organization. It would be part of the policy and procedure how that's defined um, and this is so this is just an example but uh, what that would entail would be the medical need of the patient and the necessity by which they would need to be seen in terms of a priority a level one patient may need to be seen within the first 24 hours of the emergency that they have high needs and and they're high risk so they would need to be seen very quickly a level two patient uh, would be maybe someone who uh, could be seen within 48 to 72 hours following the emergency meaning they are relatively stable. They still have significant medical needs or care needs that we need to provide, uh, but they could wait about 48 to 72 hours. And then a patient falling into the level three criteria may be someone who could have a home visit deferred for longer than 72 hours. And again, these would be specific to the organization. The organization could in also include in their emergency plan, um, perhaps, for level two and level three patients, maybe not a visit, um, but a call within the first 24 hours and then going into for a level two visit for 48 to 72 hours. Whatever the case may be, however we put this in our policy and procedure manual, it's important that we're really able to triage these patients and prioritize when we're going to be seeing them so that we ensure that our patients stay well. Uh, 
In addition to that, uh, the triaging, we want to consider uh, those that may need assistance to evacuate. We know in a time of a natural disaster, we could have perhaps a flood or downed power lines or what have you where we would not necessarily be able to reach that patient. And so we need to have be thinking about what type of assistance might be needed in that situation or that patient or client may have special uh, devices. They may be on a ventilator. Later. They may um, have another type of device that would require um, some specific transportation needs. And we want to make sure that we have a way of identifying those patients prior to the emergency. So really at the time of admission and updated throughout the time that we're caring for the patient that we would be able to identify that. Additionally included in an emergency preparedness plan would be the succession plan. And a succession plan is really defining how our staff members may take on new roles to ensure that we continue with seamless operations. Uh, one thing, when we're activating an emergency preparedness plan, generally speaking, there is one point person who activates the plan. That may be an administrator or an owner or someone in the organization that would be deemed to activate the plan. Generally speaking, we have an alternate that would fall in under that primary person that could also activate the plan in the event that the primary person wasn't available. So the succession plan would be exactly that. So as each person is responsible for their specific tasks in the emergency plan, who else in the organization is able to take on other tasks to keep the operations um, running as per normal state to ensure that all needs are met? And then the plan also must include a, a, a plan to reestablish the services once the emergency resolves. That's really critical uh, to ensure that we go back to our normal business and identify how we have learned from the incident and ensure that those are that were deployed during the emergency are well taken care of and ready to resume their normal tasks. So Matt, how about if you share with us a little bit about infection control? Absolutely. And infection control, of course, plays into emergency preparedness planning. Um, one such emergency, like we're experiencing right now, um, can involve uh, an outbreak of a, of a unique or novel virus uh, that affects large portions of the population in one specific area or in a larger um, area or even the world. Um, and so making sure that you have a great infection control plan is, is a component of making sure that you have a good and solid emergency preparedness plan. So specifically, the infection control plan uh, is put in place to prevent or stop the spread of infections in healthcare settings as well as in the community at large. And so you can see here we have uh, the four main components of your infection control program and planning uh, that you need to make sure that you have thought through and have a plan, policies, and procedures around these areas as well. So of course, prevention and infection surveillance is the best way. Uh, the best plan of action uh, for infection control is to prevent that infection from happening at all. And so part of that is going to be great assessments of the environment and the practices that uh, are happening in and around the patient uh, to make sure that they are preventing the spread of infection if one already exists uh, or uh, more ideally preventing the uh, infection from occurring at all in the first place. Of course, along with your infection surveillance is going to go hand in hand with education. That needs to be uh, both internal education of your staff uh, to make sure that they understand the key components of infection control and what that looks like from a healthcare practice perspective, but also providing that education to family members uh, and patients themselves to ensure uh, that the patient and their family remains uh, protected as well as the community at large. Uh, so we in the in-home care space uh, have a unique responsibility that often goes beyond just the patients that we serve. We spend a lot of our time educating those in the community around us, whether the caregivers for the patients, the patients' family members, or facility staff members in facilities where we might be visiting patients um, as well. Certainly, we want to focus on those that are at highest risk. 
Uh, so you look at people who are immunocompromised, diabetics, cancer patients undergoing treatment, uh, as well as uh, the elderly and the pediatric population. Uh, so we look at uh, those two populations in particular in having a decreased immune response uh, versus those, uh, those of us who tend to fall more in the middle of that range, um, and uh, as well as our homeless populations. So again, uh, being community-based care providers, uh, we sometimes have uh, the responsibility to care for somebody that is homeless or maybe living in a homeless shelter, and they are, of course, at a higher risk of uh, contracting an infection just simply because of the environment in which they live. So we need to focus on those uh, and keep that in mind as we're performing our assessments. And finally, you have ongoing evaluation and management. You need to make sure that on an ongoing basis, you're doing routine uh, retrainings as needed on infection control. Uh, doing spot checks, maybe ride-alongs or skills checks with your staff. Uh, you think especially of like hand hygiene techniques and doing uh, some observations or bag technique. And we'll talk about some strategies uh, around those areas of infection control in a few minutes. Uh, but again, ongoing evaluation to make sure that those standards you've set for your organization continue to be followed. And then the management of any infections that happen from a reporting perspective and um, from a, so you can track and see uh, where the etiology of any infections that are occurring happen, uh, when those infections occur, uh, so that you can keep a uh, good track on that uh, to be compliant with the QAPI uh, policies and procedures at your agency. Just like uh, Wendy was talking about with our emergency preparedness, infection control is also included in the conditions of participation. Uh, there are three standards each for home health and for hospice uh, in the regulations, the conditions of participation for each of our organizations, and those uh, specific citations are listed for you there. Uh, so you can reference those and review those and make sure that your policies and procedures are in line with what is required from, from uh, CMS. And again, those components, in addition to what we've already talked about, uh, making sure that your infection control program is written into your policies and procedures and that your staff has an understanding of what those policies and procedures are. Oftentimes we review those at the time of uh, new employee orientation, but making sure that those policies are reviewed frequently and updated as necessary based on uh, new requirements that come forward from, uh, from our uh, leadership organizations at a federal, state, and local level, as well as, of course, your accrediting agency if you have one. Again, uh, this is, uh, we've had a lot of conversation at a high level from an organizational perspective, but remember, the heart of what we do is our patients. And so we need to be evaluating those patients that are at high risk via a risk stratification tool so that we understand which patients are the most uh, at risk for uh, uh, contracting an infection and how we're gonna manage that infection should that occur to any one of our patients. Certainly, uh, there are some federal requirements for reporting uh, communicable diseases. Uh, so that information is available on the CDC website for uh, publicly reportable infections. Uh, but we also need to have an internal reporting of those infections. Uh, you think especially as we're coming out of cold and flu season um, and into coronavirus season, um, we want to report if there's a particular clinician, for example, that all of a sudden we see four or five of their patients come down with the flu after they've received uh, visits from a particular employee. Um, being able to have the reporting and statistical data on when and where those infections are occurring uh, and, uh, and uh, other information about those infections are going to help uh, drive your infection control program and help you prevent inf infection across uh, both your staff as well as the patients that you're serving. Again, implementing those infection control procedures to prevent the spread of infection. Uh, so this is uh, not more timely than it is right now uh, as we're having this conversation, making sure that good hand hygiene uh, techniques are being utilized throughout your organization, 
uh, to prevent the spread of infection uh, amongst your staff as well as amongst the patients that you serve. Again, make plans to deliver care to those in need. Uh, we'll talk in a little while about some of the uh, challenges that we're facing under the current conditions in visiting patients in facilities, uh, for example, um, or patients that might uh, need specific contact precautions uh, related to an infection and how that might impact the care that we're able to deliver as an in-home care or giving agency. And finally, again, uh, it's worth reiterating the education of your staff as well as your clinical partners um, is just crucial to making sure that the infection control program that you have established at your agency is carried out effectively and consistently. So some of those infection control measures that you might consider implementing, and you should, uh, would be to avoid close contact with people who are sick. Uh, again, remember uh, that that spread of infection can happen by touch or by droplet or by contact um, or even uh, airborne precautions. So again, we want to follow those standard precautions and avoid close contact with those that are sick wherever possible. Um, certainly avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth um, or your ears or any other uh, mechanism that's going to allow any potentially infectious material to enter uh, your body. Uh, when you're sick, uh, please uh, stay at home uh, if at all possible, um, unless you're going out to seek medical care. Staying in the home when you're sick uh, helps contain the spread of infection from spreading to the community or, or um, those patients uh, that you're serving. Uh, certainly, uh, it could create some staffing challenges uh, however, our ultimate goal is to keep our patients and our staff safe. Practice frequent hand washing. Uh, we'll talk in a few minutes about some best practices about how specifically to do that and when you should, but frequent hand hygiene is always a great uh, infection control technique to take. Remember those pieces of personal protective equipment. So when it is warranted, uh, wearing gloves, uh, a mask, a gown, or even foot protectors uh, can help prevent the spread of infection. Uh, and protects both the person wearing the PPE as well as the patients that we're serving while we're wearing the equipment. Be sure to disinfect all those surfaces, your supplies, and your equipment. Uh, anybody who's been in home health care for any amount of time uh, knows about bag technique uh, and the, the procedures for those things. Uh, again, remember uh, not only are we potential vectors uh, to carry infectious material, but the items that we use, our tools uh, as clinicians can be potentially infectious. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're disinfecting those surfaces and supplies. Um, consider single use items. Uh, again, uh, the environmentally friendly amongst us might not like hearing this, uh, but sometimes the single use disposable items are the best for preventing the spread of infection. Things like uh, paper towels um, and hand soap uh, rather than uh, using a, a dish towel or a hand towel uh, after washing your hands or performing hand hygiene, especially in the healthcare space. Um, remember the surface barriers uh, and those need to be um, impervious. Again, we don't want to uh, accidentally set our bag on top of a nice fresh newspaper uh, on a pile of some sort of liquid that now uh, has reached uh, our nursing bag. So those surface barriers are important. And remember, those need to be impervious to liquid. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about bag technique, but remembering and performing consistently uh, good and compliant bag technique is a, a very key uh, component to preventing the spread of infection. And then finally, making sure that you are uh, properly disposing of waste that's generated in the home and be mindful, of course, of the federal, state, and local regulations uh, about the disposal of biohazardous waste or potentially infectious material. So finally, the last definition we'll talk about is what if exactly is uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is, of course, the topic of pretty much every conversation going on uh, in the world right now. Uh, so it's, it's great to understand the facts about what COVID-19 is uh, so that as healthcare providers, uh, we can speak intelligently and confidently about what it is in our communities. Uh, so as we know, this is a new illness uh, that affects your lungs and airways, which is caused by a novel coronavirus. 
coronaviruses themselves are not new. There are about seven of them that are known and identified, most of which infect animals. Uh, but there are now two, uh, including uh, COVID-19, uh, that we know infect humans. So some of the symptoms of the current coronavirus outbreak, COVID-19, uh, are cough, a high temperature, so that's a temperature that's over 105 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, patients experiencing shortness of breath, as well as a sore throat. So remember, this is a uh, respiratory, a lung and airway um, affecting uh, virus. Uh, everything we know right now uh, indicates that this is spread by the droplets that are produced when you cough and when you sneeze. But remember, those things can uh, land on hard surfaces. Uh, so we know that we've, uh, we've been doing some studies on this, that it can live on hard surfaces for uh, up to a couple of days. Uh, so uh, while the droplets are what is spreading that, uh, remember, getting those droplets on your person uh, or on a surface around you can impact the spread of the illness. Um, currently, uh, treatment for COVID-19 uh, there's no specific cure treatment per se. Uh, of course, we're working on that along with a vaccine to prevent the contracting the virus. Uh, but the treatment that you that you will receive is going to be symptom-based treatments, uh, reducing that cough to prevent the spread of the infection. Um, things like antipyretics, uh, so your Tylenols and your your um, Advils to prevent the fever and decrease the fever. Um, and again, uh, remembering to uh, really uh, keep in mind those social distancing uh, suggestions from the CDC and the National Institutes of Health uh, to prevent the spread. So uh, let's move on to the next component. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face every day as it uh, relates to emergency preparedness and infection control. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yes, and we know that the information regarding COVID-19 is changing daily, so thank you for that overview. Um, so let's look at emergency preparedness challenges right now and, and how uh, we can navigate through these. Again, you'll see I am true to uh, my commitment to, to talking about communication. So first and foremost, communicating the plan. Uh, we've got to be right now uh, thinking about how best to communicate plans to our staff, our patients, our partners, our clients, our other healthcare providers, and those federal, state, local, tribal, regional, and emergency personnel. Right now, phone lines are full. Uh, folks are using, many folks are working from home and using alternate means of communication in order to do that. And sometimes you'll find that you can't always get through on those lines. So really looking at um, how we are communicating our current emergency preparedness plan out. If we're in a situation where we are developing an emergency preparedness plan now, that's okay. Uh, that means that we're, um, we're preparing and we're uh, supporting our patients and our, our clients and caregivers and, and certainly personnel. So we want to include um, the, those challenges and overcome those challenges in terms of communicating that plan. Looking at evac evacuation planning and, and looking at our resources, right now we know that resources are tapped. Uh, so how can we be creative and what do we have in place to ensure that safety? We know that in some regions of the country, transportation is interrupted right now. Uh, so what are our alternate means for those of us, either those of us that are traversing to see patients, but also, for the patients that we serve. And, and we talked about uh, earlier the medical need uh, and perhaps the special equipment need. What does that transportation look like? Certainly, um, we talk about potential natural disasters. Um, those can happen at any time. And in the in the midst of uh, what we're facing now, we know springtime can be an interesting weather time for most of our nation. So we've got to keep an eye on that and consider that a challenge as well. Our business continuity is critically important. And again, as we're looking at social distancing right now, that's a phrase that is becoming very common in our language and conversation. Uh, how does business continuity look when we're also looking at social distancing? Are we operating from many different sites versus one centralized location? And again, I'll go back to that communication then as being very important, but ensuring that we are navigating the challenges before us to ensure that business continuity 
security, and then safety concerns. Uh, we have to put the safety of our staff, our patients, our clients, our caregivers, the families that we're serving uh, at the top. What are the safety risks and what are our challenges to ensuring solid safety for all? And how are we mastering those now in the midst of uh, this global pandemic? So again, we cannot say it enough, communicating in an emergency. Sometimes the traditional mode of communication may be limited. And as I stated, we are seeing that a little bit right now. Uh, I know myself, I've experienced some changes in my internet speed where it may be a little bit reduced at, at high times during the day when lots of folks are using it limited or no cellular communication. Uh, we know regionally when we're, when we're out uh, caring for folks in their homes, uh, sometimes we go to rural areas where we don't have communication from a cellular uh, network and that can become a challenge. And then also understanding and knowing that the emergency conditions change rapidly. Uh, the means of communication by which one was available at one moment and it's no longer available the next, that can change very rapidly along with the actual need to communicate through the emergency, which can change very rapidly. So really ensuring that we're thinking through these challenges uh, and thinking about how to solve for them. We want to come, we want our emergency preparedness plan to come to the table solving for the challenges that we have. And there's no better way to solve for those than to openly communicate with about those, think about them, and then try and develop a solution or resolution. There's various means of alternate communication. And so let's think about what that looks like. We talked about a phone triage where you would have your point person. So say the activator in your agency, the person who is responsible for activating the plan. That person then may call five people uh, in the organization. Those five people may then call five more people and so on and so forth until we reach out to all of our patients or clients and let them know what to expect during this emergent time. That is great when the phone lines work. We also can consider alternate means such as texting or emailing. Now, if we're looking at traditional texting and emailing, we want to ensure that we're careful because we must remain HIPAA compliant. Uh, we all are healthcare providers and we know the importance of HIPAA compliance. And we also know that texting and email is not always secure. So we need to ensure that we have a messaging system there that where we can still message each other, but but maintain that HIPAA compliance. There is sometimes in some um, electronic health record technology, there are means of communicating within that technology that becomes secured messaging or is secured messaging. And that would be a phenomenal way to communicate um, provided that your team, your, your staff has access to that technology and is using that. And we'll talk more about technology solving in an emergency uh, later on in the presentation. But then also something that sometimes we don't think about is that availability of a radio station. Our local radio stations look to partner with organizations and particularly the medical community and particularly during times of an emergency. The radio stations will broadcast uh, emergency messages from providers uh, that are tailored to the clients that they serve, the patients that they serve, and the staff. And so one thing is to obviously, as part of that emergency preparedness, set that up early on, uh, knowing that a communication challenge may be um, a real relevant part of, of what we're seeing in, during an emergency. Set that up early. And then make sure that uh, the staff and the patients are educated to know that they need to uh, listen in to that radio station and be prepared to take their, um, their cues from that. And then we also need to make sure that we have timely communication with the appropriate authorities. That's very important because, again, this is a collaborative effort and we may need those authorities um, to help us serve the, our patients. Another real challenge that we will face would be uh, the limited resources of personnel, and this will be on our next slide here. Um, the, the great thing about the post-acute in-home care space is that uh, we understand that uh, we frequently work with a staffing challenge as it is now. And I'll wait maybe until we get this 
uh, next slide moving. There we go. So one thing that we know uh, in the in the in-home care space is that we already operate with staffing challenges. That is the nature of who we are and how we seek our um, to serve our patients. And so we know uh, that that can be a challenge. When we have an emergency and we have to activate an emergency, uh, that challenge becomes even greater. And so some statistics and facts as to why we're facing a uh, staffing shortage just might help us understand during an emergency preparedness uh, planning uh, operation. We know that we have 3.8 million registered nurses today. Of those 3.8 million nurses, 85% of those are practicing. So we already have a deficit there. 53% of those 85%, and I'm sensitive to this, are over 50. So we know that um, that changes uh, sometimes their, their working availability, right? They're maybe um, in the mid to late part of their career. Um, we also know that an estimated 70,000 of our nurses will retire uh, annually by this year. We're not seeing an influx coming into the industry in terms of nurses. Younger um, folks are not necessarily choosing to go into nursing at the rate that we would like. And we're also seeing a shortage of nurses who are going back to educate so that we can drive nursing programs and drive folks coming in. So we're seeing this funnel that's getting um, really, really limited here. Uh, we also know that in the post-acute in-home space, so our home-based care providers, the turnover rate is roughly 82%. That's a high turnover rate. Uh, we know that what we do as a post-acute in-home care provider, it's stressful, it's challenging, it's taxing, and there's a high burnout rate there. And so... Um, we are looking at that as an industry. We, we see articles um, and, and blogs daily about how to retain our, our quality staff uh, and looking at alternate ways to ease that, that stress for them. Certainly in a time like this, when an emergency plan is activated, we know our medical professionals are, uh, are very taxed. We know they're tired and uh, we know that uh, the burnout is, is super super significant. Uh, the silver tsunami, um, we have 10,000 Americans becoming Medicare eligible daily. Uh, that's staggering. And by 2030, one in five Americans will be classified as a senior citizen. By 2050, 88.5 million people will be over 65 years of age here um, in the United States. And that's significant. And then by 2060, the senior population in the U.S. will double. So while we're seeing less folks heading into the medical profession from a nursing perspective, we're seeing the need greater because we do know that the majority of our healthcare dollars are spent in the last two years of life, meaning we have increased medical need in the last 18 months to two years of life. We're seeing that an increase in the age and not in the aged population and not necessarily that increase in the medical professionals serving them. So uh, something to consider as we're developing our plans. And Matt, how about you share with us some of that infection control statistics too? Sure, sure. Thanks, Wendy. And uh, as a nurse myself, just seeing those numbers, it's like, oh my gosh, um, we've, got, we've got a lot of work to do um, and we've got to find some more nurses. Um, so let's take a listen to what some of the agencies are saying about infection control. So uh, these are statistics from a study uh, where we asked some agencies what they felt the most challenging aspects of infection control are. Uh, so it's things like collecting and reporting data, 33%. So just slightly over a third uh, of agencies are reporting. They don't have a good way to collect and report this data. So again, seeing trends that might uh, give them clues on how to prevent the spread of infection um, is a challenge for a third of agencies. Um, adhering to and monitoring to bag technique, 17.8%. Adhering and monitoring to hand hygiene, another 15%. Um, so those two things, uh, again, we've already talked about are uh, great and in, in incredibly essential ways to prevent the spread of infection. Uh, and we've got, you know, 
another third almost uh, of agencies reporting they are not having a good uh, amount of compliance from their staff uh, with being able to either adhere to that or monitoring their staff to make sure that they are uh, in compliance with the policies and procedures that the agency has set up. Um, adequate field staff coverage. Uh, so this gets to uh, what Wendy was just talking about. You know, 15% of agencies are reporting the most challenging aspect of their infection control is perhaps we don't have enough staff. So if somebody doesn't have a fever, I'm gonna make them work even if they're not feeling great. Um, so uh, again, how that can impact your infection control uh, and the overall morale of your staff, um, making sure that that staffing coverage that we know is crucial, uh, again, highly reported. And then finally, uh, you know, managing patients that have multi-drug resistant organisms, C. diff, not knowing you know, how best to manage those patients uh, some people just weren't sure what their most uh, challenging aspect was, and then we had just a few that uh, said other. So again, uh, we take a look, a large chunk of that is collecting and reporting data and being able to monitor those uh, crucial elements such as back. So of course, we mentioned this before, uh, another great risk factor that faces us every day uh, as in-home care providers working out in the community is that nursing bag that we carry with us that we put in our car, that we bring into our homes at the end of the day, can be carrying quite a lot of germs. Uh, so again, just to give you some statistics, to give you some idea of how much uh, the importance of disinfecting those bags is, the outside of nursing bags, 83.6% uh, are positive for germs. Um, inside the bag itself, 48% positive for germs, and the equipment that we use and we touch to our patient's skin a lot of the time, 43.7% positive for germs. Uh, so again, this just highlights the importance of good bag technique uh, to prevent the spread of infection um, as we are going from home to home or facility to facility, uh, providing care for uh, often an, an older population who we know is at high risk for infection. Not using a surface barrier in the home, uh, another great potential risk. Um, having inadequate personal protective equipment. Uh, again, planning for those things, especially in times of emergency, uh, can really um, exacerbate a problem that already exists even before we have uh, a situation such as this pandemic uh, on our hands. And then finally, improper hand hygiene. This is a major risk uh, for everyone involved in the care continuum from the person providing care to the person receiving care, uh, to those ancillary uh, people that are uh, around uh, us, our family members, uh, our, um, our community, as well as the patients' families and the facility staff uh, in places where they live. Of course, we know uh, under uh, our current environment, uh, we have some additional challenges uh, again, making sure that we have a defined uh, and implemented emergency preparedness and infection control plan that accounts for uh, this uh, large outbreak that we're seeing worldwide. Uh, limited resources, we've talked a little bit about that from a staffing perspective statistically, um, but also limited supplies. Remember those gloves and masks, the hand sanitizers and soap uh, and paper towels, all of those things that are part of a good infection control infection control program um, are uh, in short supply, especially right now. We are seeing some restricted access to patients, especially those that live uh, in facilities or larger uh, care communities. Uh, and we have this need for social distancing to slow down the spread of this novel virus uh, that none of us have received a vaccination for. Um, so we need to keep as much social distancing as possible uh, and balancing that with our patients' needs to receive the care that we provide. And finally, uh, especially from a home health care perspective, we're seeing um, agencies concerned increasingly about an increased lupa risk. Uh, again, we're having to maybe have missed visits, perhaps. Uh, our patients or their family members aren't wanting us to come and visit in the home coming out of the community, even though the patient might need that care. Um, so that increased in missed visit, uh, even just one visit can result in a lupa and that can have a significantly negative impact on an agency's cash flow. So uh, again, we're undergoing, in addition to the challenges we're facing in these areas uh, traditionally, uh, we have some increased 
uh, risks under the current environment. So uh, on to some best practices. Fantastic, thank you. So some emergency preparedness best practices. Uh, when we're thinking about actually planning with, uh, for our emergency preparedness uh, plan, we want to ensure again that we're really solidifying and defining a solid, solid plan. And then just as important as defining that plan, communicating that plan, and there it is again, communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, but so important that everyone really understands and knows what to expect because that will help things run much more seamlessly. Then implementing the emergency preparedness plan. What does this look like? How do we activate? How do we make it happen? Uh, and what are the steps to take once we're inside that plan? Again, very, very important from a best practice perspective is that business continuity. And here we see that word again, communication. Uh, looking at different ways to do that, a family portal, virtual meetings, secured messaging, all of those different uh, aspects of that business, the communication tools needed to maintain that business continuity. Very, very important from an emergency preparedness perspective. On the next slide, we want to talk about the phased plan for responding to emergencies. Uh, this is a very key and important um, part of a best practice for emergency preparedness. We uh, talk about that first phase as the readiness and preparation. So earlier on, when we looked at our key elements, we looked at defining um, what we will need, identifying the needs and really defining that plan through that risk assessment, understanding what's going to happen from a resource and equipment perspective as well, so that we can be solid as we move forward in our plan. Right now, we're seeing that there is a limit of equipment uh, available for folks. Folks are uh, struggling with masks and other uh, personal protective equipment uh, and other supplies for patients. And so it's critical that we put that into our plan from a preparatory standpoint. Again, talking about how how we're going to risk level classify our patients. Uh, that is incredibly important so that once the emergency is deployed, we are prioritizing who we need to see and ensuring that as we prepare, we're thinking about all people that we will be in touch with, our agency staff, our patients, our families, and our caregivers. Then we talk about activation and relocation. That's another phase of our plan. When the plan is activated, what does that mean for all that are involved in the plan? How are we going to transfer the patients and the staff? We may need to transition staff and deploy staff in other areas just based on the emergency, right? And then how are we gonna safeguard our records and equipment? Matt talked about that a little bit earlier, um, making sure that we have that data to drive the decisions that we need to make is critically important. And that's our records. And then certainly our equipment becomes our supplies, but also uh, it that may be our data collection equipment too. So. Uh, important to understand how we're activating. Right now, what I've heard is that a lot of uh, organizations are having their, their uh, teams work from their homes. So we've had to allocate those resources for equipment needs and what have you. Looking at continuity of, of operations, we want to continue to operate both during and in the immediate aftermath of the emergency. And there's one thing I want you to think about here. When we're deploying folks during an emergency, we think of it as adrenaline, an adrenaline rush, right? So if we think right now for the emergency personnel who are caring for the folks that have uh, been diagnosed with the COVID-19, um, they're, they're working on adrenaline, right? They're working long hours, they're caring for high-risk patients, they are gonna need a break at some point. Um, and, and we wanna ensure that we've allocated that break time throughout uh, the uh, time that they're, throughout the emergency, but then immediately after the emergency, we do need to resume business as usual because we've probably, again, prioritizing our patients. Uh, we need to make sure we're touching base with all. Those folks that were on the front lines of the emergency, they may need a break. So that's where we have that succession plan, right? Where we have others that may be able to take the to take the reins and help give those folks a break. So that's something to think about in the plan and it's real and we're living that now. And then reconstitution, when it's safe and able, we wanna make sure we're resu resuming normal operations. In doing that, 
we need to make sure that we're evaluating how we perform during the emergency and what changes we may need to make in the future to ensure that we have an even more seamless operation. So throughout the entire plan, we want to ensure that we're documenting. As we're building out the plan, as we're executing and activating the plan, it's really critical that we have a centralized place where we could document the plan. Um, so we want to be able to identify the patient's triage, and you can see here in the screenshot what I'm talking about, the emergency triage, and there's uh, four criteria here built into the solution. And then determine and document an emergency evacuation plan. What does that look like uh, for patients and how do we document that on an individual basis? And are we able to pull that data into a report so that we can see that quickly and make decisions according to our data very, very quickly? We want to ensure that we have a list for needed equipment, medication, and all supplies. Very, very important. And then identify the emergency contact. We always want a secondary contact in the event that we're not able to reach the patient or client that is in need of the care so that we have a completely seamless operation um, and, and not miss anything that we're uh, that we need to address so we'll talk a little bit now about some basic infection prevention and control guidelines uh, so these are things we all should know but i think it's really helpful to review some of those things uh, we already talked about education and consistently reviewing that information uh, as a critical element to a good infection control program so first uh, we'll talk about disinfection uh, so remember to clean those surfaces and your equipment remember that nursing bag 84 percent of the time that has germs on the outside of the bag uh, as soon as it is practical to be done after it is used um, and it's also important to remember that we want to clean with water and detergent before we use some uh, other high level disinfectant or sterilization process because some of the germs or some of the chemicals that might be on the outside of those bags especially uh, might react with some of those disinfectants and actually uh, cause more harm than good uh, or cause uh, some damage to the equipment that we're cleaning. Hand hygiene, of course, we know is the number one thing that we can do to prevent the spread of infection. So we need to make sure that we are performing hand hygiene at the appropriate times, both before and after contact with patients or clients. Um, after we remove our gloves uh, when we have been working with a patient. Of course, if our hands are visibly soiled or dirty, or if we come into contact at any time with any bodily fluid of any kind. Uh, and then remember, we want to avoid uh, those artificial fingernails and things like jewelry and watches. Remember, uh, those are areas that can harbor germs, and we often forget about them, especially when we're uh, performing our hand hygiene. Uh, keeping uh, those nails trimmed. Um, I, you know, as a male nurse, have my, my fingernails look impeccable. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that uh, that that portion of hand hygiene is not something that's forgotten. Uh, isolation precautions uh, are another thing to keep in mind. Of course, we know that we perform standard precautions for every patient at every visit every single time. Um, and we want to prevent the transmission of those infectious agents. Um, so uh, when a patient has become infected, we put these isolation precautions in place to protect uh, ourselves as caregivers as we are going to see other uh, patients, uh, but also to prevent the spread of those infectious agents. Uh, our personal protective equipment that we talked about earlier uh, is the way to do that. And remember, using the appropriate uh, PPE is very important. Uh, oftentimes we worry about not wearing enough PPE um, and there is also scenarios where we can wear too much PPE. Uh, so again with the uh, novel coronavirus uh, I think especially of uh, people that are putting on shoe protectors. Remember, the more PPE that you put on, uh, the more PPE you have to take off. And in removing personal protective equipment, uh, we increase the risk of spreading any of those infectious agents uh, that have come into contact with the PPE that we are wearing. Uh, and then again, making sure that we dispose of that PPE properly. So remember, uh, sometimes uh, that needs to be done uh, 
via the biohazard waste process, um, but making sure that any uh, infectious material is properly bagged uh, and properly disposed of in accordance with uh, your policies and procedures, but also with federal, state, and local regulations. So again, hand hygiene, um, the CDC recommends that, as, again, as I mentioned, is uh, paramount in preventing the transmission of pathogens. Um, washing your hands often at the frequency that we've already discussed. Uh, lathering with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. So I think every one of us these days is proficient at singing happy birthday, uh, if not twice, more than twice, uh, prior to rinsing with water. Um, so again, we know soap and water is the best uh, hand hygiene technique to take. Uh, we also know that acceptable is alcohol-based hand sanitizer when our hands are not visibly soiled uh, or when we are not dealing with a patient that has uh, a infection such as C. diff. Uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer is not a sanctioned uh, way to uh, clean your hands after caring for those uh, patients in those particular situations. Um, Alcohol-based hand sanitizers must have greater than 60% ethanol uh, or 70% isopropanol, uh, again, in order to be effective as a uh, proper hand hygiene technique. Uh, and remember when you're using these sanitizers to cover all the surfaces of your hands, the backs of your hands, between your fingers, uh, scrubbing those fingernails, uh, and rub your hands together until your hands are dry. Don't uh, take the shortcut way and uh, rub your palms and then rub your palms promptly back on your scrub hands. Um, you're not going to be cleaning your hands very well that way. Again, that personal protective equipment. Uh, the three main things uh, we'll talk about here uh, are going to be gloves, gowns, and then uh, eye, nose, and mouth. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, mouth, nose, and eye protection. Um, so those gloves, again, uh, be sure to wear those uh, when it can be reasonably anticipated that you're coming into contact with a patient's skin uh, or any other bodily fluid. Again, it's just best practice uh, to uh, don gloves when you're performing patient assessments uh, to make sure that you keep your hands clean to protect yourself and the patient. Um, make sure your gloves fit uh, and that they are durable uh, for the task that you're going to be performing. Uh, again, wearing extra large gloves if you have small hands or vice versa, um, you are not going to get the proper protection from those gloves if they are overly stretched or if they're too loose to allow um, the uh, influx of potential pathogens that you may come into contact with. Be sure to remove those gloves uh, after contact with a patient um, and their surround and or their surrounding uh, environment. Remember, uh, those uh, germs, those infectious materials, can potentially live on hard surfaces, and uh, you don't know maybe when that bedside table was last cleaned. Um, and then again, perform that hand hygiene uh, after you have removed the gloves. Um, of course, this should go without saying, but we should never reuse gloves. Um, so if you're removing them uh, using the proper technique, you won't have an opportunity to do that anyways. Um, but again, uh, remember, these are not reusable uh, materials. Uh, and then change gl uh, gloves during patient or client contact if your hands um, are moving from a contaminated body site uh, to a clean body site. Again, we want to protect ourselves, but we also have a responsibility to protect our patients. So going from clean to dirty or, and back and forth, uh, make sure you're changing your gloves uh, between uh, those different areas of the body that you might be um, assessing. Uh, our gowns are worn to protect our skin and our clothing uh, during direct patient contact. Uh, again, remember, uh, gowns should not be worn unless they are uh, part of the contact precautions that the patient is on. Uh, you want to remove your gown um, according to those guidelines and perform hand hygiene once you have removed that gown. And again, uh, gowns are not to be reused. So sometimes I know we've walked down hospital hallways and you see uh, a gown hanging on the inside of a hospital room door. Uh, again, even if it's inside the patient's room, uh, those are not reusable materials. We want to make sure that we are preventing the spread of infection. So those need to be disposed of after each use. Um, with that being said, you need to make sure, especially if a patient is on uh, contact precautions of any kind, that you come into the room prepared so that you don't have to uh, don and doff your personal protective equipment multiple times because you did not come into the patient's room prepared. 
And then finally, uh, we know the face, the mouth, the nose, the eyes are very vulnerable. Um, they are entry points to the insides of our body, which can make any infection that we might get potentially uh, much worse. Uh, so we want to protect those. Um, again, uh, during patient contact, so things like masks, goggles, and face shields, uh, where warranted, are great ways to protect those sensitive areas of our face. Um, again, remember, we don't want to wear a PPE that is above or below uh, what's going to be required to take care of the patient to protect both them and uh, us as healthcare providers. A few reminders here about bag technique. Uh, so again, we're going in and out of our homes, but we're also, remember, going in and out of our cars. We're going in and out of our own homes. Uh, and so the germs that we carry on those bags um, are a uh, very significant uh, infection risk. So we want to make sure we're following the so Again, as a quick review, um, your bag needs to have at least three compartments. You're going to want to have two clean sections and one uh, quote unquote dirty section or reusable section. Uh, those clean sections need to be the separation between uh, your equipment for documentation, whether that's paper charting uh, or more ideally, of course, uh, some uh, a laptop or a tablet, whatever it is that you're using to document or even your phone. Um, and then uh, one where you're going to have those clean um, single use supplies. Uh, and then, of course, your dirty side will be uh, your reusable uh, side. So things like uh, maybe a, a sphygma mammometer or your stethoscope uh, that you're going to be cleaning after, uh, after each patient use and returning to your bag. Uh, make sure those hand hygiene supplies are in an outside pocket. Um, and wash your hands, please, before reaching into the bag. Uh, remember, even if we're coming just from our car, uh, we've maybe shook the hand of uh, our patient or their family member, uh, so our hands are potentially already dirty, so we don't want to put anything uh, that might be on our hands into our bag, which should be a clean environment. Um, and then uh, you want to wash those hands again every time you need to re-enter your bag. So if again, if you forget to get one thing out, uh, make sure you remove your gloves and perform hand hygiene before going back into the bag. Uh, again, never, ever, ever place your bag on the floor. Uh, not only are it, our floor, even the most clean floors uh, there, uh, we know that those infectious agents that we can't always see um, can live on those hard surfaces for days at a time. Uh, so that's there. And then, of course, uh, the bottoms of our shoes. Sometimes we pick up germs from the places we've been before. So again, a bag should not be on the floor. Uh, again, uh, if you need to put your bag on a barrier, use a waterproof barrier. Again, make sure that that bag doesn't get wet um, or uh, get soiled from uh, any surface that you might put it on. Uh, discarding your disposables in a sealed bag uh, and making sure that uh, those uh, get disposed of correctly in accordance with your uh, regulatory uh, agencies. Again, wash your hands before repacking the bag. Um, clean your reusable items before returning them to the bag as well. So again, uh, a lot of times we go out and we perform an assessment. Maybe we check a patient's blood, uh, uh, blood oximetry. Uh, we do uh, a listen on their heart for their heart sounds or the lung sounds with our stethoscope. You want to clean those items before putting them back in your bag um, to prevent uh, spreading uh, infection. And then clean and disinfect your bag at least weekly. Um, again, remember, wash it with soap and water before you use any other disinfectant, uh, again, to prevent any interactions between the disinfectant and anything that might be on the outside of your bag. Of course, uh, if it's not documented, it's not done. So you want to make sure that you're documenting these plans and your compliance with them uh, as part of your uh, clinical record for your patients as well. Um, so that assessment of the assessment we talked about of the environment and the infection control practices that are being performed in the home or at the facility um, are important. Make sure that you have developed a care plan based on any problems you identify. Make sure that you have patient specific and measurable goals and interventions uh, around education and around any standard or isolation precautions that might be in place for the patient, as well as any other infection control practices uh, that you're implementing for each patient that you're seeing. Remember also that uh, education and teaching component is so important uh, based on your assessed needs. Uh, again, a lot of our in-home patients, their family members, uh, or a higher caregiver is the person who's primarily coming into contact with a patient. 
So we want to make sure that uh, those people that are primarily providing care for our patients uh, are protected in addition to us and our staff, uh, but also that uh, the patient and their family members are protected as well. So that education piece is so crucial. Uh, make sure your documentation is in line with your infection control program. Uh, so we talked about the need for infection control policies and procedures at the agency. Uh, make sure that the components that you include in your policies and procedures are consistent with the documentation system that you have um, and with what your staff uh, is being educated to document in the clinical record. And then make sure you focus your documentation on uh, the use of equipment where needed, uh, the devices and supplies, uh, and your cleaning of those, uh, and then any ongoing evaluation and interventions that need to be done as it relates to your infection control program. Finally, I do want to take uh, just a couple of minutes to talk about uh, some of the concerns that we're having in best practices for patients that live in facilities, especially during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I want to point out the CMS guidance that has been put out uh, for, um, for practitioners who are going uh, to provide services for patients that live in a facility. Um, all facilities nationwide are to restrict visitation of all visitors and non-essential health care um, except for certain compassionate care situations such as an end-of-life situation. Uh, so again, even those clergy or bereavement counselors that are crucial members of the hospice interdisciplinary team uh, should be allowed um, into the facility to provide services for the patients that we're serving. Uh, it also serves as a great way um, to have some uh, social interaction for those residents of facilities where uh, they can't get visitors. Uh, again, this needs to be done very cautiously and on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, all visitors, even if they're coming in uh, for these compassionate care situations or they are healthcare personnel, um, should be screened uh, by the facility for fever and for respiratory symptoms. We know these are the two main sim symptoms that we've been seeing of COVID-19. Uh, the visitors that are permitted should wear a face mask while they're in the building and restrict their visit to the resident's room uh, or any other locations that have been designated by the facility. Remember, just like we as home in-home care agencies have our emergency operations plans, facilities also have their own emergency operation procedures that they are trying to follow and be compliant with. Uh, so we need to be mindful of that and ask how we can best uh, help them maintain uh, their emergency procedures as well. Uh, and then, of course, we should remind them to frequently perform hand hygiene. Uh, again, we can't say enough how, how important it is to keep your hands clean. And then finally, for, enter, uh, for individuals who uh, do enter a facility for compassionate care situations, um, the facility should require that they uh, perform hand hygiene and use the PPE, uh, such as face masks. Again, we want to try and prevent the spread of infection from the community into these uh, nursing facilities, uh, assisted living facilities, where we have a very vulnerable population to be taken care of. So um, that uh, is wraps up some of the best practices. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we can solve some of the, the challenges that we're facing with technology. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. So empowering our remote workforce. We know right now that folks are working remotely uh, primarily. And so what do we want to look for in a technology partner to ensure that we're supported during this time so that we have the information we need to care for our patients and clients right at our fingertips? That would involve a cloud-based system with 100% uptime. Uh, very critical that that system is stable and solid so that we know that the solution will help us to drive the care that we need to provide in the home. We want to ensure also that that solution would have a web and a mobile-based solution so that we could be mobile and not necessarily dependent on that internet or Wi-Fi connection, that we would still have the critical information uh, ready to use. And then in addition, a true technology partner will provide that thought leadership in terms of online resources and training. Uh, while we are out uh, taking care of our patients, we know that information is changing on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And when we have a technology solution that is really taking the lead in terms of ensuring that that information is available to us, uh, both from currently what's happening in the, in, uh, the news, not necessarily the news, but health related. Um, and also then uh, with cues on how to help us um, 
work through the technology, that's really important so that we don't have to take that extra thinking time. It's all right there at our fingertips. We want also to ensure that the technology keeps us compliant and that that technology is, is really providing ongoing validation to ensure that compliance for us because uh, we're humans and we, uh, we know we need that added support occasionally, particularly when we're working uh, under some nuances uh, due to the emergency that may be a little taxing for us. Having that validation is key to our success. We want reports at our fingertips so that we can continue to make informed decisions. And we touched on that earlier in the presentation, but knowing that we have a partner in technology that has seamless reporting and ease of use in that nature to help us drive the business decisions moment to moment that we need to make that real-time information, very critical. And then streamlining our operations. Uh, right now, operations may be taxed. We're looking at things a little differently. We talked about the importance of that secured messaging within the technology solution itself, having that secured messaging available so that we can communicate back and forth with our staff um, to the needs that are upcoming um, currently and any changes that we need to make for them. In addition to that, the scheduling and staffing component of a technology partner really should be robust for us and ensure that uh, we can have that seamless scheduling. Try to avoid those missed visits or if there is a missed visit, see if we can reschedule on demand so we don't lose sight of that patient and really understand what we need to do there. An orders management system that is solid is also very important uh, right now. Uh, Matt's done a phenomenal job talking about the infection control. He shed a lot of light in terms of what we need to be thinking about right now as patients care changes and potentially infections happen, we need to be able to get that information to a physician quickly to change that plan of care. A tight orders management solution will allow us to, uh, to really get timely orders and, um, and have a seamless plan of care. The clinical intelligence, we talk about clinical intelligence. So understanding that as we're answering an assessment question for a particular patient or client, that built into our technology, the technology is receiving what we're answering and is helping us to generate uh, the next best response by triggers in the system to ensure that we are capturing our assessment of the patient into our documentation. Very, very important. Uh, revenue cycle management and billing services. Again, a nice offering for a, a technology partner uh, to help us particularly now in a time of need when operationally we are really looking at how we're deploying our staff to care for our patients, what's happening on the back end for us. We need that cash flow to continue. A partner who's able to provide those billing services and revenue cycle management services so that we can sleep at night and have some peace of mind that the cash flow someone is managing to get out those invoices and uh, those claims so that we can know that the cash flow is continuing as we have all hands on deck making sure that our patients and clients and staff are being served. And then we've talked about the dashboards and reporting. Having a dashboard where we can really see the health of our business as it stands right now and perhaps some of the demands that we have ahead of us, very important that it's real-time data and being able to pull reports so that we can ascertain uh, that best practices are being met and that we're making timely decisions decisions, those reports are really, really key. They, that is the pulse of our business. And then Matt, if you could share with us about choosing that right technology partner. Absolutely. So uh, we've talked a, a, already about a lot of those technology uh, advantages uh, that uh, are provided uh, by using uh, technology uh, during a time uh, like what we're facing right now. Um, make sure uh, that the technology that you select uh, has a has a policy and a program that is easy to use for your entire team. Uh, we are stretched thin, certainly from a staffing perspective, and we've talked about a lot of that from a field staff and a clinician perspective. But we also understand that operationally, 
uh, during uh, times of emergency and as it relates to infection control. Uh, those reporting and communication tools that are available are critical in making sure that you can uh, maintain agency operations even during an emergency. So making sure that you have a solution that is easy to use for your entire team. Having a cloud-based platform will ensure that the data that you are entering in, into that uh, platform is available to you and to your staff uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter where you are. Uh, so if you're having to run a remote office and keep up with social distancing, uh, you have access to your information in real time all the time. Um, having mobile apps and solutions available, uh, like you see the nurse here, um, having that at your fingertips allows uh, for them to continue to provide care uh, and do that point of care documentation so that that cloud-based platform has the most up-to-date information. Uh, and it is much easier to disinfect a cell phone or a tablet or even a laptop computer than it is to disinfect a piece of paper. Um, and then uh, having that technology available in an offline mode. We've talked about the challenges of communication uh, when phone lines are down or cellular networks are taxed uh, or, or internet uh, is speeds are slow. Um, making sure that you have access to your solution uh, regardless of whether you are connected to the internet is crucial to maintaining those agency operations. Streamlining all aspects of your operation uh, are important as well. So automation uh, of your workflows, again, for your clinical staff, as well as for your administrative and operational staff is incredibly important uh, for making sure that your business can continue. Uh, and we also want to facilitate team collaboration. So again, uh, when an emergency warrants uh, remote work, whether that's remote office work or remote field work, you want to make sure that your team is able to collaborate through messaging uh, and uh, perform meetings uh, in very uh, disparate locations as from, from time to time. Um, even as we sit here and talk today, Wendy is in uh, in Michigan, and I am in Texas. And so uh, through the uh, technology and, and the collaboration tools um, that we have uh, available through technology, we're able to uh, bring this information to you, even though uh, we're uh, a couple thousand miles apart. So choosing that right technology partner and see that's how it happens when we're thousands of miles apart. We just like to say hi. Uh, so, uh, so our clinical intelligence, uh, we talked about clinical intelligence and, and you can see here an example of that where we can, we have hyperlinks here where we can click right on to understand what we need to know about COVID-19 and the symptoms of COVID-19. Those are all critical pieces that clinicians can use to teach their patients and their caregivers uh, and clients what's important. Uh, and so looking at a solution that partners that way is very important. A solution that has a proven track record that is dependable, that is reliable, um, and truly ease of use for the clinicians. Knowing that we, um, we need an innovation leader in terms of our technology solution and a built-in training and education so that it's ongoing. Uh, healthcare is changing all the time. And so knowing that we have a solution and a, a technology partner who is right on the cusp of that change is incredibly important for our success. Um, taking time to, to make those choices is important. We, Matt and I wanted to include also uh, in this webinar some resources uh, for continued learning and training specific to what's happening now uh, in our country. Um, these are reputable resources uh, that that one should be using on a regular basis to get uh, truthful, reliable information uh, regarding uh, the global pandemic and how that is affecting the United States and medical care at this time. Resources from the National Association for Home Care and Hospice, from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, from CMS, uh, from the Centers of Disease Control, from the World Health Organization. Please uh, find these resources uh, useful and visit them frequently. As we say, uh, the resources and the guidelines are changing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, moment to moment. So um, we just thought that might be helpful for you. Um, our final thoughts, in the middle of a difficulty lies opportunity. And we all need to remember that now more than ever. 
we are in a situation that we haven't been in uh, in the United States in, in, if ever, in a very long time. So it's important that we come together now Let's serve each other, serve and support our clients and the patients um, that, that our clinicians and our caregivers are serving um, now more than ever, collaborating together uh, to build uh, a solid foundation by which we know we can keep each other well and encouraged uh, and keeping our patients safe and healthy at the same time. So we'd like to thank you for your time here. And, and Matt, you may have some final comments for us. Yeah, I do. Uh, just again, from a housekeeping perspective, don't forget we will be providing everyone uh, with a link to the slides. Uh, and we will uh, be posting uh, a copy of this webinar of, uh, on our website, uh, which is access.com. Uh, so those things will be available. Of course, I know the resources page, uh, I'm sure you all were furiously making notes so that the slides will be available. Um, I do apologize that we ran out over time just a little bit uh, to run out of time for questions. Uh, but for any of you who have put questions in the chat box, we will be sure to get an answer to you uh, via email. So we will respond to those. Uh, and as Wendy said, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we at Access are trying to deliver on our mission to empower um, healthcare organizations and professionals like you uh, with the world's best technology solutions. And so we appreciate you taking time out of your day uh, to learn a little bit about infection control and emergency preparedness. Uh, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home healthcare technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access, empowering care anytime, anywhere.